Hello there. Good morning and welcome to Calvary Temple Church in St. John. We are so pleased to be able to spend this time with you worshiping the Lord together. We're going to get right at it this morning and Pastor Laura is going to lead us in worship. Let's worship together. Thank you. 
Yes, Lord, you are our living hope. You are alive. And you love us deeply. Thank you, Father. Right now we're going to prepare to partake in communion. So if you want to get your juice and your cracker or bread ready, we're going to uh, do that in a few moments.
So I've been reading through uh, a book called Dangerous Prayers by Craig Rochelle, and uh, he mentioned something about communion, and I thought it was very fitting for today. So these are his words um, taken from his book, and it starts off in Mark chapter 14, verses 22 to 24. And it says, as they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them, and they all drank from it. Verse 24. And he said to them, This is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice for many. Like the bread he broke at the table, Jesus' body would be broken. Then after sharing the bread with his disciples, Jesus held up a cup of wine. Jesus slowly and deliberately and lovingly explained that the wine represented his blood. Before, before long, he would spill his blood that would cover the sins of guilty men. He was the Lamb of God. The sacrificial lamb would be slain. As Jesus looked into the eyes of those he had chosen, explaining that he would be dying for their sins, he knew that Peter would deny him and that Judas would betray him. Yet, he continued to love them and explained that he must offer his life. Luke notes something a little different than Mark, Mark did. In Luke chapter 22, verse 19, it says, He took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Almost all Bible scholars agree that Jesus' instruction to do this provides believers a way to remember, honor, and celebrate his death and resurrection. But some scholars believe that Jesus' instruction to do this includes more than a simple and short act or a ritual involving bread and juice. Some believe that Jesus do this also refers to how we are to live. We don't just remember Jesus during Holy Communion at church. We remember him in how our, we live our lives daily. Because Jesus' body was broken, because his blood was poured out for us, we too should live daily for him, broken and poured out. By giving of our lives, we find true joy. So that rather than pursuing our will, we surrender to his. Instead of trying to fill our lives with all that we want, we empty our lives to make a difference in the lives of others. So, this morning, as you partake in this bread and this drink, let us commit to remembering daily the sacrifice that he made for us by surrendering our lives for his will each and every day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you were broken and spilled out for us. That, Lord, you died on that cross for our sins. That, Lord, you saw that great divide that divided us between you and us, and you wanted to fill that, and you knew how to break down that divide. Lord, I thank you that as we drink this juice and as we eat this bread, that we can do this daily in our lives, that we have an opportunity to live for you each and every day. Lord, I pray that we will make that commitment this morning to wake up in the morning and to say, God, what do you have for me today? Thank you, Lord, for your great sacrifice. And I thank you, Lord, for the hope, our living hope. You rose again on that third day and one day, we will live with you forever. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You may partake of the bread and juice, and we're going to continue to worship the Lord as we sing. Lead me to Calvary.
for your great sacrifice for us that we through faith in you can have life to the full and I pray Lord that we indeed in this moment would have life to the full abundant life rich life complete life Lord in you because of your death and burial and resurrection your power at work God whatever those needs are those concerns today that press in on us and weigh on our hearts I pray, Lord, that in this instant now we would give them to you. We would give them to you. Maybe today we even need to physically reach out and just reach out to you, Daddy God, Father God. We give them to you. You see, you know all the needs, all the concerns. We reach out to you in this very moment. We say, help us, O oh God, King of our lives. Even in this instant, maybe, Lord, we haven't known you much. We haven't really, until this very moment, thought of you. Those words that we've sung are so true. King of my life, I crown thee now. In this instant, I acknowledge you as God, as Savior Jesus. And I crown you as the king of my life. Take over my life, Lord. Even in this instant, maybe retake over my life for some. Lord, lead our, our lives. Fill us with your presence, with your power in this moment, Lord, for your glory, for your credit, for the sake of the renown of your name, Lord God. Have your way in us. Have your way in us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to move into a time of announcements. And so I'm just making my way to you, around the piano, over the bush, and through the woods to grandmother's house we go. And I uh, just wanted to mention uh, this fun fact that I thought was interesting from the life of our church. I uh, wanted to mention to you that it was noted to me this week that 100 years ago this week, this past week we've just come through, the very first wedding was held in this building at 83 Sydney Street in beautiful uptown St. John. And it was the, the wedding of Jim Gilly's parents. And Selena mentioned that to me today. And uh, I, or this week, and I just thought that was so special, so interesting, and uh, a little bit of interesting uh, congregational connection there. And I thought I would pass that on to you. Wanted to remind you that our website is the place to get all of the latest information about our church and the things that are happening, similar to our Facebook page. And uh, you can get you can get information there. Wanted to remind you that on Monday of this week at one o'clock, we have an in-person prayer meeting for up to 10 people in the church building, if you're interested. Also, this Tuesday night at 7 o'clock, we have a Bible study online on Zoom, and we're looking at listening to God through the Scriptures, studying some passages of Scripture, and we'd love for you to join us. Uh, we email out the uh, security code for that, and so if you're interested and don't get it, please uh, message us uh, if you're able to, and we'd love to have you join in with us. And then on Friday night, uh, Friday night, yes, at 7 o'clock is our Deep Water Next Gen Ministry for teens, young adults, and young families. And we're looking at the evidence that demands a verdict study. It's discussion and video, and we've been learning much, and so we really hope that you're able to join in on that. want to remind you that our month of July item for our pantry food ministry is keep cans of meat or fish. And uh, we hope to have those in, if possible by today, and so if you can please uh, zip those in at some point, that would be great, and it helps support our pantry food ministry. The month of August item is going to be Cheese Whiz, and we aim for a 100 of those items each month to help us as we reach and serve those around us uh, with the love of God. So please be aware of those things, and uh, we hope to uh, be able to continue to worship with you, either in person or online, as we go through this season. And uh, please, again, check our website and our Facebook page for the information that will allow you to best participate. And there's also information there about how you can give financially if you choose to worship the Lord in that way and further the work of God through Calvary Temple Church 
around this world. So please look for that information as well. We're going to move into our teaching time today, and I wanted to share this. Pastor Chad? Yes. You forgot about me. I did forget about you. I'm so sorry. That's okay. I, I didn't have But a, you can stay there. Yeah, I will. I okay. didn't have an order here, and I was going by memory. Good catch. I'll try. Oh, good catch. Good catch. Write it down. I caught good. <laughs> so I brought my keys with me today. These are actually there's my church keys. There's quite a few there. Yeah, there is a little bit. Now, Pastor Chad normally has those keys, well, not mine, but his, that look a lot like that in his pocket, along with our car keys and our house keys and our garage keys. So there's all kinds of keys, right? Yes. Yeah. And I know that Pastor Chad's favorite thing to do is, is to go to the house and haul out the church keys and try to open the door with the church keys. That never works, does it? No, it's no. quite frustrating. Or if he arrives at the church and he hauls out our house keys to get into the church, kind of frustrates him a little bit. But you know what? That's how keys work. If you don't have the right key for the right door, it's not going to unlock it. So we're looking at John 14, 6 today. And it says, Jesus answered, I am the way and I am the truth and the life. The only way to the Father is through me. So I can't start my car with my house key, but I can't get into heaven without the right key either. No house key or car key will help. Some think they can get into heaven by being nice especially the people they don't like. There are also people who believe that they don't use bad words. They'll have no problem getting in. Others think that they, the way to heaven is by going to church every week and giving lots of money. Although that probably makes you feel good, that's not exactly the key to get into heaven. Pastor Chad, you know what the key is? Is it this one right here? No, it's not a physical key. I thought it might be this big one. No, it's not that big one. This is the biggest one. <laughs> no, I just read it for you. Jesus oh. answered, I am the way, I am the truth, and the life. And the only way of the Father is through me. So, if we believe that Jesus saved us when he died on the cross, just like we celebrated with our communion just a few minutes ago, and we accept his gift of salvation, that is our key to eternal life. The only key to eternal life. Thank you, Pastor Lord, for You're sharing welcome. that. Sorry, I forgot you. I'm sorry. I wanted to uh, to further what Pastor Laura was uh, talking about there with this uh, little story that I wanted to share with you. The story of Adam and Eve was being carefully explained in a children's Sunday school class. The following story, the, in the following story, the children were asked to draw. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Following the story being told, the children were asked to draw a picture that would illustrate the creation account from the Bible. So little Bobby was most interested, and he carefully drew a beautiful picture of a car with three people in it. In the front seat, behind the wheel, was a woman. In the back seat, uh, there, there was a man and woman in the back. And so the teacher, I'm getting this all confused. There's a man behind the wheel, in the back seat, a man and woman. The teacher was at a loss how this exactly illustrated the Bible lesson about Adam and Eve. But little Bobby was prompt with his explanation. He said, well, see, the guy in the front, that's God driving Adam and Eve out of the garden. Cute, cute. Get it? Driving out of the garden. Cute. Don't forget, we have some sermon note helps with you that might help you stay a little more on track than I am right now. But you can find those on our website to follow the teaching if you want. This today is our first and inaugural biblical presentation for the summer of 2020. And we're going to be working through July and August this summer on something called Summer Road Trip, which I think is a great idea. Who doesn't love a summer road trip? The title of this morning's Bible exploration is The Untitled Sermon. We're on a journey through the Bible. We want to explore through the next few weeks the redemptive narrative that is woven through every chapter and testament of the Bible. The Pastor Laura and I will be alternating sharing the teaching responsibility each week through this series this summer. And so we're quite excited about that. Uh, you'll get me one week, Pastor Laura the next, back and forth as we go through. So I want to ask you this question. Have you ever caught a glimpse of something before? caught a glimpse of something. I remember one day as a kid, I thought I had lost my mom in a store. As I love to do, I've been playing around, going inside the circular topped clothes racks, and uh, kind of like it was a little hut. In the middle was an empty spot with all the clothes on the circular rack, 
and I used to go in and out and play and whatever while mom was shopping there. And so I kept catching glimpses of my mom through the rack. She was right there, right by me, and I, I felt good. I, I had the reassurance of the safety of her love and protection. But then as I was playing, I got distracted, and my mom turned and moved just a few feet. Suddenly, all the, I looked, and I couldn't see her. I didn't know where she was. She wasn't where she had just been, right beside me. I thought she was lost forever. So when I cried out, of course, she turned, and the three feet she was from me, it felt like a, a couple of miles and she was there with me instantly, and it made me feel a lot better. But those glimpses, this morning we want to catch glimpses of redemption. Even in the fall of man, the sin of the original humans, as recorded in the book of Genesis in the Bible, I really do believe that God's master plan of recovery and re reclamation can be found throughout the entire Bible. So we're going to dig into God's word about this this morning. If you have your Bible, why don't you turn to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. And we're going to pick it up in verse 1. It reads, The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. When he asked the woman, Did God really say to you not to eat from any of the trees of the fruit of the garden? Well, of course we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. The servant replied to the woman, you won't die. God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it. And you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Well, the woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was indeed beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. She wanted the wisdom it would give her, so she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. In verse 11 of Genesis 3, the Lord God asked, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? The man replied, It was the woman who, who you gave me who gave me the fruit, and I ate it. And then the Lord asked the woman, What have you done? The serpent deceived me, she said. That's why I ate it. Verse 14, then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, you are cursed. More than all the animals, domestic and wild, you will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth. You will desire to control your husband and he will rule over you. And the man, to the man, he said, Since you listened to your wife and ate from the fruit of the tree that I commanded you not to eat from, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow you will have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. In verse 20, Then the man, Adam, named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and Eve. Then the Lord said, Look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take from the fruit of the tree of life and eat it? They will live forever. Then the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now this morning's glimpse of redemption number one is God walked through his creation in Genesis 3.8. It's really interesting to me to think about God walking in the cool of the evening through the garden. And I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say my favorite time of the day is the cool of the evening. Uh, it's been pretty hot here in New Brunswick, and pretty warm temperatures, a lot of mugginess. I really don't like that. I love the coolness. I can relate to the Lord uh, coming out and about in the cool of the evening. But it's interesting that he went through his creation. The humans heard him coming and going. They knew of this. 
And it's interesting to me that they knew of his activity. God was active in his creation. This makes me think of his redemptive plan and his purposes. He was active in creation. Genesis 1, 26 to 27 and Genesis 2, 7 reveals that God formed man. Humans are made in God's image, it says in verse 26 and 27, like God. In Genesis 2, 7, it talks about the breath of life from God. Relationship was key. There was something very unique about humans. God created man for communion. Relationship. Previously in the biblical book of Genesis, God saw, it said, in a number of places, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six different times, God said what he created was good. On the sixth day, in Genesis 1.31, he said after he created humans that it was very good. You see, God made man to be in relationship with him. A very unique factor here. God breathed life into humans. And he wanted to have a relationship with them. Our second glimpse of redemption is God called for man, but he already knew. In verse 9 of this text, God called out, where are you? But God is all-knowing. He's omniscient. He, he knew exactly what had been done. God already knew. He calls out. God wasn't searching like, oh, no, I've lost that human. Where might he be? I'm not sure. Like a little piece of Lego. No, God knows. God knew then and he knows now. God knows even today when we fall. God sees. God knows the deepest part of us. Yet he still provides redemption. Thank you, Jesus. Just like with the first humans, God also wants us to admit with our own words where we've been and what we've done. I ask you this. What excuse did Adam give to his children as to why they no longer lived in Eden? Why he no longer lived in Eden? Someone once said that Adam replied, well, your mother ate us out of house and home. <laughs> Just joking. This morning's third glimpse of redemption that we find in the Genesis account is in verse 11. God asks, who told you that? Who told you that you were naked? You see, God sees the whole, inter the whole picture, uh, but there's an interest that he has in developing this relationship further with us. And he asks us, well, what made you do this? He wants conversation with us, friends. He asks Adam, and he still asks each of us, what's going on with you? He asks Eve, why did you do this? What made you do this? What were you thinking, he asks me today. He asks us today, who is speaking into your life? I remind you today that Genesis 3 reminds me that Satan, the enemy of our souls, only speaks half-truths and confusion into our lives. But I thank God that God still calls to us. He still asks. Psalm 91 verse 15 says, When they call on me, the Lord speaking, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you invite us to call out to you. Jeremiah 33 3 says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. Psalm 50 verse 15 reminds us, then you will call on me in trouble and I will rescue you. I will be there for you. Psalm 86 5 proclaims to us today, you Lord are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call on you. Psalm 91 15 reassures us that he, he's there, he answers, he hears us. The psalmist in Psalm 145, 18 to 19 writes, The Lord is close to all who call on him, close to them. Yes, to all who call on him in truth. He grants the desires of all who fear him. He hears their cries for help and rescues them. Joel 2, 32 and Acts 2, 21 and Romans 10, 13 all announce the same thing that even in the last days, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You see, God created us for close connection with him, a closeness, a godliness, an interaction. And I thank God today that we can call on him and know him personally. He wants us to call to him. Jesus told a story in Luke 18, in verse 9, he said some people had come with great confidence to God in their own righteousness and scored everyone else. He said, here's an example 
Jesus said two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, a religious leader, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee, the religious person, stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I get a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest with sorrow and said, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, the sinner, not the Pharisee, returned home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. For the Lord, it's all about our heart. This morning's glimpse of redemption number four is God could have just left man in his sin in Genesis 3.22. God could have just left us forever apart from him because of that sin blockage. You see, in Genesis 3.22, the Lord said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and also eat from the tree of life and eat it and live forever. See, God admitted here that if God allowed man to eat both from the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, humans would actually technically be without some supernatural intervention or rescue, they would be forever eternally lost without a relationship with God. But God couldn't allow this. God would not allow this, and I'm so glad. We see a further glimpse of redemption in the prophetic promise of defeat for the devil. Here we see this prophetic promise to defeat Satan. In Genesis 3.14, as I read, the Lord said to the serpent, because you've done this, you of all, all animals, you will crawl on your belly, you will... You will be cursed. You will eat the dust all the days of your life. I'll put enmity in verse 15 between you and the woman. And between your offspring and hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God promised that the serpent would, would indeed lash out and strike one of the woman's offspring. But the offspring of this woman would crush the head of this evil serpent, Satan. The promised deliverer spoken here is Jesus who would indeed defeat Satan and also the power of death. The Apostle Paul speaks of this in Romans 16, 20, when he wrote that God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, he said. We find a further glimpse of redemption in God making the clothes for the humans. Now, that's a pretty amazing designer label. You know, it's, it's not Tommy Hilfiger, it's not, you know, Calvin Klein or any other great label, but it's God made. God made. God provided animal skins for these first humans. This was really a very first sacrificial death of sorts to help cover the consequences of the sin of the humans. It speaks about this further later on in the Bible in Leviticus 17, 11. Uh, it speaks about how there must be the giving of blood uh, for the remission of sins. It speaks of that in the New Testament in Hebrews 9, 22. But without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And so this is a part of that. God's animal skin clothes were so much better than man's weak attempts at covering his sinful shame. What did they use? You might remember from the biblical text, they used something to try to cover themselves once they knew they were naked. What was it? Yeah, fig leaves. Now, have you ever seen fig leaves before? I don't know if you've actually seen them. Uh, further question that's quite practical. Have you ever wore fig leaves? Doesn't really work out the best. Fig leaves are quite strange uh, plants. Not really very big. Not the best for covering a human body. Kind of itchy. As a child, my Aunt Winnie used to make, my great Aunt Winnie actually used to make uh, clothes and to towels, that's it, yeah. Blankets and uh, toys and other things for me, homemade, home sewn, home knitted. Uh, she just died a few months ago, but uh, she, she made so many great things out of love for me and I, I used them. In fact, on our bed right now, we still have a blanket that she made us and uh, made me when I was a child. And it just made me think about God making these clothes and lovingly preparing these and caring for his children. Adam, even though he already tried to make the covering with the fig leaves, he still wanted to hide from God. God wanted to be with Adam 
and he made more durable clothes so that he would not be awkward in his nakedness, but covered fully. God made clothes for Adam and Eve so that they wouldn't know continual deep shame and fear, especially in their approach to God. Humans now needed some kind of a covering since the pure, protected, perfect, holy relationship with God was now broken. You see, innocence was lost. God made clothes so Adam and Eve could come more comfortably in a relationship with God. Whenever your kids are out of control, you can take comfort from the thought that even God's omnipotence did not extend to God's kids. After creating the heavens and the earth, God created Adam and Eve, and the first thing he said to them was, Don't. Don't what? asked Adam. Don't eat the forbidden fruit, God replied. Forbidden fruit? We get forbidden fruit? No way! Where? Don't eat that fruit, God said. Why? Because I'm your creator, and I said so, said God, wondering why he hadn't stopped after making elephants. A few minutes later, God saw that the kids were having an apple break, and he was angry. Didn't I tell you not to eat that fruit? The first parent asked. Uh huh, Adam replied. Then why did you? I don't know, Eve answered. She started it, Adam said. Did not, did so, did not. Having had it with the two of them, God's punishment was that Adam and Eve should have children of their own. Thus the pattern was set, and it has never changed. Just joking. I do want to encourage you with this serious thing today. Redemption can be found throughout the entire biblical narrative. Yes, this teaching series is, is a journey that we're embarking on today, exploring the, the story of redemption that can be found throughout the entire Bible in every chapter and testament. I love catching glimpses of one of my favorite places in the world, Prince Edward Island. When you're traveling to Prince Edward Island and you get close, coming down the coast, maybe from Shediac, close to the bridge, you can see the bridge in the distance and you catch a little glimpse of a little jut of land of PEI across the North Auckland Strait, and it's just a speck of land, but you know, we're going to vacation land. That little glimpse reminds me of the glimpses we've gotten today. Even in the beginning of the Bible, even in Genesis, even when this beautiful creation is marred by human selfish sin, there's still a restorative purpose and plan that God had. Aren't you glad that God purchased our freedom? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7 says, He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. I thank God that he's redeemed us. I do remember, remind you, we are brought back to God with a high price. 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, For you were bought with a high price. You must honor God with your body. 1 Corinthians 7.23 challenges us. God paid a high price for you. So don't be enslaved by the world. Friends, today let's live for him. Have you opened your life to Jesus Christ today? Why not surrender to him today? Maybe for the first time, maybe for the 60th time. Today, Christian, you may be listening to me today. I encourage you that we were bought with a high price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. God became man for my sin, your, your shame, and provided relationship and an opportunity for restoration with him. We need to Get to know him more. Live for him. Surrender to him. Let's pray. God, I pray you would help us to indeed surrender to you, to indeed live for you. I ask God for if there's people today that have never opened their lives to you, I pray that they would do that right now. I pray, Lord, that we would admit we have shame, sin, wrong, that we are selfish and prideful, that we live for self, and that's not what you've designed us for. That sin, that shame, we might not even recognize it. We might not even be aware of it, but Lord, it separates us from you. And the only thing that bridges the gulf, the gap between us and you because of that huge chasm of sin is Jesus Christ, is the blood of Jesus, the cross of Jesus. So Lord, we pray today that we believe you, Jesus, are God. You're the only answer. And we confess it, we admit it. Jesus, I need you. God, I need you. Maybe say that out right now. Even if you're a Christian, God, I need you. And I pray, God, that you would fill our lives and we begin or re-begin or continue a relationship with you. Help us, Lord, to remember that we were purchased with a high price. We were bought back to you. And, Lord, we now need to live in dedication to you and surrender to you, Lord. 
May we be your witnesses, God, today. Help us, we pray, and teach us more about this redemption that you've purchased, God. May we be a redemptive people, Lord, as we walk forward. Can't wait to worship with you again soon. God bless you.